And good day, everybody out there, and welcome to another edition of The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. I'm Dr. Z, Dr. Eugene Zampro, naturopathic uh, wellness program on health and alternative medicine today. Thank you for joining us, and you can always get more information on our websites, which is naturalnurse.com and drznaturally.com. Kind of rhymes there. Well, today we have a fabulous show. I can't wait to start uh, discussing with uh, my long-term friend and actual co-host of a radio program that we did for many years. Uh, we have uh, Master Amenny Harris on <clears throat> our uh, show today. And the topic's going to be mantra marma therapy, healing the marma energy vortexes with prescribed mantric words of power, and seven dragons yogong a system of mind-body-spirit-energy exercises. A little bit about uh, Amani Harris. Uh, he began his career as a research scientist in the chemical engineering and paper, waste, water treatment, mining, and enhanced oil recovery, and he earned four patents. But he was a lifelong student of yoga and yogic sciences for 45 years, and he studied with Sri Swami Satyajananda of Integral Yoga over a 15-year period, and became a senior yoga and medical Qigong instructor. Um, and he's always been interested in the healing power of food, and so he studied at the Natural Gourmet Institute and obtained certification in Chef Corps Mastery, and he earned his MS in Nutrition at the University of Bridgeport, working as a clinical nutrition and food therapist, specializing in enzyme nutrition, naturopathic nutrition, and even African world food therapy, and he taught as an adjunct professor of nutrition at the College of Naturopathic Medicine, um, teaching holistic nutrition to the third-year naturopathic students. He's a herbalist and herbal products formulator, specializing in Ayurvedic Chinese medicine and ancient Egyptian medicine. And worked, he's worked at many medical centers, including my center, the Naturopathic Medical Center, Integrative Wellness and Life Prescriptions. <clears throat> he also has really... Uh, helped me quite a bit in traveling to Chinatown, co-leading our education tours with the natural nurse. You know, we take people to Chinatown once or twice a year to learn about Chinese medicine. And again, being an international lecturer in holistic health, he was radio host for 20 years on WPKN Bridgeport, working with myself and other uh, programmers on the program Black Introspectives and Integrative Wellness. Recently, he earned a doctorate in Ayurveda at the Ayurvedic Institute under the Dr. Vasat Ladd from 2005 to 2013, writing his dissertation on the healing power of kitchery and set up clinics in Antigua, West Indies, and in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, helping to train medical doctors in Ayurveda. And his main focus now is as a writer and teacher in the ways and science of Ayurveda, and he's the author of the soon-to-be-released books, which is the, the subject of our show today, Mantra Marma Therapy and Seven Dragons Yogang. Also, he wrote, he's writing The Five Elements Seasonal Herbal Healing System. Amani, welcome to the program. <laughs> so, I, was, I was there um, thinking for a moment. It sounds like... Um, you're talking about someone else, but in <laughs> fact, uh, <laughs> um, I'm happy to be on with you this morning. How are you doing today, um, Doctor? I'm doing great, and mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for taking time to educate the listeners about yoga, qigong, and the power of the mind and healing, and and uh, tap into the, the the source. You know, so let's talk about let's start the program with actually defining yoga and qigong because that's kind of an integral part of of what you're trying to share today. Is Ellen with you? I wanted to say good morning to her too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's with you? No, Ellen Ellen uh, has the day off, but she's listening. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Sorry. I I thought she was with you since you um announced her. Um yeah. So your question again, please. I wanted to you would talk about yoga. Okay. And the yoga sutras mm. and um, tapping tapping into the source and mm. why and how that influenced you and then how you took also uh, qigong and combined mm. the two into this amazing system called yogong. Yeah, so maybe I'll start a little bit about my background. Uh, 
as to how I got into yoga. As a, as a teenager, I was, I'm like 6'3", and um, 230 pounds or so. And it just so happened that as a teenager, I had a big um, growth spurt one summer, and I was much taller than my, you know, classmates. And they used to tease me a lot about being bigger and taller and so forth. So I had a self-esteem kind of issue around being bigger than them and so forth. So it used to bother me. So as a way of escaping that kind of um, uh, taunting and, and, and uh, pick, being picked on, I spent a lot of time in the, the, the public library. And one day while I was there reading <clears throat> books, that I, I'd read a, a book per week or so, I found a book on yoga. <clears throat> and um, it had all these this yogi from India doing all these uh, seem, seemingly, <coughs> sorry, seemingly impossible postures with his body, twisting and, you know, inverting his body and twisting and bending and so forth. So I, 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 it somehow it, it intrigued me and also it came to my, my consciousness that I somehow knew how to do this practice uh, from some previous time. And so I started borrowing the the book. One of the, the introductory chapters spoke about the nervous system and the endocrine system, the hormonal system, and how those get very much um, strengthened um, by doing the practice. And then one gained self-confidence, peace of mind, and so on. So I started practicing it, and it changed my personality. So I stopped being, being an introvert and sort of shy from people and spending more time with books than with people. I began to even trying to teach my colleagues and friends um, yoga. You know, I was about 13 years old. I was early 1970s. And I found that as I practiced on a daily basis, I became stronger, more uh, self-confidence, um, clear in mind about my gifts and talents, and also I, I developed a strong self-discipline to practice every day. And not only that, it gave me gave me the discipline to do any other uh, um, activities I was doing. Um, I became grounded and mass and, and and developed mastery of those areas that I was focused on. So it, it helped me with my studies. Helped me with being more sociable, helping with, um, you know, finding my path and, and following it. So I, I advocated this for anyone who wants to get a clear understanding of why they came in terms of this lifetime, building internal confidence, clarity of mind, mental focus, concentration, and the ability to um, become self-mastered is to the practice of yoga. So that's basically how I got involved with yoga. Uh, upon graduating from high school, I came to the United States to continue my college studies. And I, just because I got so much benefit from the yoga daily practice, I continued doing it. And upon graduating from from college, I I, I moved from Florida to to Connecticut, and um, was still with my practice. I I found a teacher who I studied with for a few months, and he said, you know, you're quite quite have quite some mastery of the yoga, at least the the physical yoga pra- practice, the asanas, and he said, you know, why don't you become a teacher? So, I decided to. Well, I asked him, well, what do what is the commitment? He said, well, you have to go to this ashram, this monastery, and live with these monks, and study for like, you know, four weeks. Uh, and I said, well, I just got married. I have a sm- uh, only a, a, a short amount of vacation. I don't see how it's possible to go away for a whole month. <clears throat> Anyway, over time, it came to pass that I went to the, um, the ashram, the monastery in Virginia. And long story short, the book that I found as, as a teenager in, 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 in Antigua, in the Caribbean, is the s- same teacher who was the head of that ashram that became my teacher uh, as I studied there. So there's no coincidence, is the point I'm making, is that sometimes things come to us because it's in our destiny to follow a particular path. And so um, I studied the seven levels of teacher training that they had there, um, the beginner level, um, intermediate teacher training, advanced teacher training, and then all the auxiliary teacher training. Like, for instance, we're going to get into, um, sure, the Yoga Sutras and the teachings of Patanjali, which is the mastery of the mind through yogic science. And that was one teacher training. And then, you know, medical kind of Qigong practices like for cardiac 
patients um, and for stress management and other um, yoga um, teacher training um, programs I took there while studying over a 15-year period. How does... How does uh, yoga still the thoughts of your mind? Because a lot of people think yoga is just, like I said, the physical asana, as you call them. But really, the goal is to control the thoughts and have union with uh, the divine. Is that true? Yeah. And if you go to the, the what they call the philosophy and science of yoga, and it, it, which is called the, the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, this is a, a great sage um, master who wrote um, what I call sutras or treads that bind together the, the science of, of yoga. In the second sutra, in, in the, the portion on contemplation, he talks about, uh, he says, uh, the, 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 the quote is, yoga chitta vrti narodaha, and it, it means in English, it means the restraint of the modification of the mind self is yoga. So let's break that down, unpack that a little bit. <clears throat> the restraint, meaning the, the control or regulation of the, the, the mind stuff or the thought waves, all right, is, is yoga. So it's not just the asanas. In fact, the asanas are just in preparation for um, gaining control of the, the thoughts. You know, thoughts are more very amorphic, very elusive. Your mind goes quickly from something in the past to something in the future to what's going on presently and sometimes repeating the same thing over and over like a stock record and so on. The mind can be very easily disturbed. And this is why they have done so much studies on how to regulate and control people's mind to buying habits to uh, advertisements and, and, and marketing and so forth to study people so that they know that you program a person's mind by repetition, by and jingles, by by um, imagery that then once the person sees the thing uh, that they they want you to buy or to um, grasp a hold of or a part to to, to 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 take or a pattern to follow that you can be programmed all right so yoga is like the opposite of that if you realize that the mind the body and the the your know, spirit are all connected and one of the way best ways to gain control over the the thought of the mind is the first first thing is to regulate how the body's function so the body is 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 grounded it's stable it's not full of toxins and stiffness and aches so it's not your body your mind is not being disturbed by your own body because often when we're sick when we're uh, um, stiff and achy and so on the mind then is caught up with worrying and being tense around the physical aspects of the body so the asanas as Patanji described, more very, very precise in his teachings, is that there are two sutras that talk about the asana and the physical body. One is is that it says, stay sukham. When one uh, attains a steady posture, one can then begin to g gain control of the thought wizard of the mind. So the the first practice is to stretch and move and twist and bend and and uh, stretch forward and and so on invert the body to remove all the toxins and stiffness why the asana practice or the physical postures is to remove all the things that encumber and or make toxins or stiffness in the body so that then you're not able to be at peace, right? So when you do the practice, you're meant to do physical asanas, you're meant to sweat and detox and cleanse and rejuvenate the body so that the body becomes light and it's not um, uh, a burden on you or distraction from the mind. So you get the body, a physical body, out, out of the way per se. So when you sit, you can begin to experience a quietening of the mind. The... In yoga, there's a whole concept of koshas. Koshas mean sheets, all right? <clears throat> and most people think that they're only this physical body, but you're much more than just the, the body is just a housing, and what connects your mind to your body is your breath. So in yoga, it's called prana, the pranic body or the breath body. In, in Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine and qigong, it's called the qi or the, the qi or energy body, all right? And so with the breath, 
if you are able, the next level on the yogic um, eight limbs, you have two the two first limbs on the, the yogic system or Patanjali yoga sutras is the yama and the yama, the practices that one would adhere to or philosophical, philosophical practices that one would adhere to to give you a sense of not only moral teaching but uh, inner grounding, inner groundation so that person is righteous, upright, um, disciplined, doing good, being good, um, loving, serving, and so forth, not only always getting and taking. So you have things like non-stealing, truthfulness. These are some of the practices um, of, um, of yama, niyama, contentment, purification. These are philosophical practice, but actually active things that one would do in your daily life to bring about a, a more, a better person in terms of how they're thinking and functioning. But after that, the second, the, the third rung is asana, and I mentioned that before to get rid of the, the, the toxins in the body, the stiffness in the body, the illness in the body, the weakness in the body, uh, calm the nervous system down, make one more grounded so one could sit for hour, two or three, a whole day, if you need to, to gain control of the thought rhythm of the mind, without the body saying, "You need to move. I need to uh, stretch. I need to get up. I need to move around, and so on." Because once the body moves, the mind moves. You yeah. see, the, the the mind is more subtle than the body, but they're connected to the breath. And so, once you start moving the physical body, you begin to move your your mind begins to move. So, once you're sitting, then you start doing what I call pranayama or breath practices to control the, the thoughts because, like I said, the mind is connected to the body, the, 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 men, the, the physical kosher, the physical body, and then you have the breath body or the pranic body, uh, which is what you regulate with yogic breathing practices, and then you start gaining control of the mental body, the, the, uh, the, the um, the, the, the koshas that I'm saying, the sheets that are being regulated, the manamaya kosha, the pranamaya kosha, and so forth, the vignoyamaya kosha, which is the emotional body, which is even more subtle than the physical body. So once the, then the mental body, so once you begin to gain control of your thoughts, being watching your thoughts, and you're like you're chaining a little puppy, the mind going to usually run off and think about, oh, I went to, what did I have on this date last night? Oh, we went out to dinner. <laughs> I, I bought some flowers. She was very pretty in her dress, and we went, uh, we had a beautiful meal and, and so forth and so on. And the mind goes off, and the next thing you know, you're, you're in, a, in, a, in some uh, on the park bench with your sweetheart, all right? <laughs> Not in the present moment, because the mind's like that. But you don't beat up your mind and get up disturbed by, well, the mind is running off. Like you train a little puppy, you say, come, come, come back and sit, and sit. Mm -hmm. And you keep the mind focused on the breath going in and out. The breath actually makes a particular sound. So the sound of the breath, the in-breath sound is so, and the out-breath sound is hum. So when you breathe in, you mentally repeat the sound so, and you breathe out mentally breathe, repeat the, the sound hum. Obviously, you're using this as a mind control technique. You're controlling your own thoughts to be in the present moment by focusing on your breath and the sound of the breath. Uh, another technique that Patanjali prescribes for people who have a very disturbed mindset in terms of emotional patterns and so forth uh, is to use a, a concept called Praktipaksha Bhavana. What that means is that when the mind is disturbed by some negative thought or feeling, uh, then one should then reflect on the, the direct opposite positive thought. Mm. So then if you are filled with rage or hate, or with, about something someone did about some some situation, uh, you might think about love and seeing yourself being loving and, and caring and so forth. It is not that you're you're tricking the mind. It's like you're using the tools to keep the mind in a, in a positive um, frame of mind. You know, the mind oscillates between the po the negative pole and the positive pole. And if you can program the mind to be in the positive po pole, it you can allow the emotion and passions and disturbances that normally come to the, the regular uh, normal human mind 
to swing below you and not be disturbed, and you're not going to be swinging over to the negative, but staying in the positive by programming the mind with this positive thought, which is the opposite of the the negative that would, would disturb the peace. At some point, you one begins to be able to sit still and be in, in the present moment, and that that being in the present moment helps you are helped to be able to focus on uh, the mind on one thing at a time, meaning your concentration, concentrating the mind, this is beyond the breath. Now you're focusing on one thing, a flower, a mantra, uh, some some positive thing to keep you your mind, to transcend your thoughts and to focus on that one thing. This is mental concentration. All right? not, you're not in the meditation status yet. And then uh, over time, one lets go of that object of focus and attain a stillness that the mind is not no longer needing an object outside to focus on, but the, you experience the quietening of the top ways of the mind, which is the beginning stage of meditation. And one sits of meditation and experience goes to a place where they experience the quietening of the mind, the, the not drifting of the mind, the inner peace that comes with that, to get a, you get a, restoration, uh, re-energizing of your person, a clarity, and uh, even beginning to get glimpses of into right intuition, right insights as to problems that you may have, situations you're trying to solve, um, answers to particular situations. That is beyond the thought of the mind because the mind is, is now uh, in a quiet place, and you're not thinking thoughts as to using your reasoning or your logic or your analysis or holistic thinking, because as quiet as it's kept with human thinking, <clears throat> um, with all those uh, methods, logical thinking, reasoning, um, analysis, which is just breaking things apart to find the, the key key substantive information or knowledge and even holistic thing is seeing the whole picture and so forth can only give you 50% probability of being right. When the mind shifts away from thinking or you tap into the, the all mind, the, 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 the source of all things that makes you never uh, make a mistake that the heart is not going to be in your lower abdomen or the, the you're, you're not going to be... be um, seeing the sun rising in the west and so forth, that it's always accurate that spring never comes before winter and so on. All these things that we take for granted are governed by this all-mind God, the creator, this all-knowing source. So when you tap into meditation, you begin to tap into that knowing source, and then you get the right insights for for inventions, for creativity, creativity and so on beyond the mind. Um, I'll give you an example of that. I, I worked as a research chemist uh, in a company called American Cyanamid for many years in Stanford, Connecticut, and we were working on a project to develop some additives to paper products. You know, most people use products that in their daily life but don't have a knowledge of how things are made. Uh, for instance, the paper chemicals that are added to the paper making process to give wet strength or dry strength. So one could put, say, 50 pounds of groceries in a bag and the paper, and don't tear or fall apart because they're dry strength chemicals that make the paper uh, bag stronger than it normally would with its tens- tensile strength. Right? Then there are wet ke- strength chemicals that added to paper to give. Um, uh, absorbability of water without falling apart. So a paper towel might have in wet strain chemicals that when you wet it, it absorbs water, something spills, and it doesn't fall apart because they're wet strain agents that hold the, the fibers of the paper uh, together. So it's still uh, absorbent but still remains um, mm-hmm. in, a, in a whole sheet or so, all right? <clears throat> The same thing with a paper. Uh, See, so you have a hundred dollar bill and you forgot it in your pocket and you, in the wash. You don't want the paper to fall apart. That's a valuable thing. So the wet strand chemicals to hold that paper together, because paper and water would begin to dis- dissociate and fall, make the paper fall apart. Well, this was a paper chemical application to put into paper uh, products that have contact with food like paper cups you know we drink coffee from starbucks right. or and you don't get the paper don't get wet well the chemicals in it that 
repel the paper, the water from the the surface of the paper, and also keep its its integrity with wet strand chemicals in it, um, and even paper plates and other things like that. <clears throat> so, the point I'm making is that the FDA clearance for the the cationic, the positively charged chemicals, the polymers that we were synthesizing in the lab, were only allowed 10 mole percent, I mean 10 percent of the polymer composition, composition would be acceptable without having any, any negative uh, health uh, repercussions for people from the paper interacting with the, the liquid or the food and so on. However, in our tests in the lab, only the 20 mole percent or 30 mole percent gave the performance that the manufacturer needed to get, make it uh, economically feasible to buy the product. So after spending maybe uh, a good seven years and maybe uh, five or six team, team members, PhD types and research uh, engineers and so forth, uh, and building manufacturing plants, so hundreds of millions of dollars in invested, we couldn't get it cleared by the, the FDA. And the company even hired lawyers and, and a team of scientists to go and try to get the, the F, through the Congress to uh, appeal to the FDA to lower the standards. Right? Mm -hmm. But the, the byproduct of higher mole percentage, 20, 20, 30 mole percent in the paper product, couldn't mean that it could be caused carcinogenic uh, Toxic, release yeah. toxins into the food or into right. the food from the, the paper product. So after not having find an avenue to solve this problem, they were going to cancel the whole project. So I, being a team member from, from the beginning and one of the key persons in developing that whole product and spent many years going around the country trying to install that technology in many paper, paper mills around the country, I felt... Um, a deep connection to it. So in discussion once when I was at the ashram and it was around the same time of the, the dilemma with this product, I talked with one of the monks and he said to me, look, if you want to get knowledge beyond how to solve that problem, why don't you take a crystal bowl of purified water and put it out in the full moon now that your hair is in the full moon season? And it'll be energized, and then take that and put it beside your head and go with a clear intention of trying to understand the solution to fixing that problem. So I did that, and he said, keep a little notepad beside your, 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 your desk or your, your nightstand, and when you wake up, whatever thoughts come to you, write it down as to it might be the answer to your solution. So... I did that and, you know, in a meditative state, go to sleep with focusing only on the idea of finding a solution to the problem and with this energized water from the full moon. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. then it came to me that the next day that there's an add additive that's added to the water, aluminum salt, aluminum sulfate that's added to the thick stock, meaning where the paper is grounded up and bleached as a thick stock um, before it's thinned out to make paper sheets. And they add alum to, when they grind the paper, there's like knots in the wood, you know, like knots you see in your wooden floor when you cut lumber. Well, those knots have a lot of pigments and they are hard knots and you grind it. When they're ground up with the paper pulp, they become like holes in the paper and it's not a good thing. But the paper, paper manufacturers um, have found that when you add aluminum sulfate to the thick stock, it coagulates those um, mm -hmm. knots and have them become more dense than the, the thick stock and settles down to the bottom. You can drain it off or separate those pigments that would then make um, damage to the paper. A long story short, I'm saying is that the answer I got was to take a, a, an aliquot, a small percentage of that aluminum sulfate, and dilute it to the concentration of the additional, say, um, aluminum, dissociate into A to aluminum sulfate. The A uh, aluminum has a plus three charge, which will give additional cationic charge. And so I added the aluminum sulfate into the, the thin stock we were making the paper with the 10 mole percent cationic polymer, which is acceptable, and got the results of a 20 or 30 mole percent performance without changing, Amazing. without needing to add the more carcinogenic or toxic um, polymers that gave the performance that we needed. So I got the performance of the 20, 30 mole percent, which was acceptable for the manufacturer, without adding any more toxicity and is without any, 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 any extra cost because it was added in the same aluminum sulfate was now being added 
um, not in the fixed stock, but a small percent of it was added in the thin stock to make. So, you, so basically, you use yoga to to uh, solve a human dilemma, which is amazing by tapping into that whole superconscious mind. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. So wow. what what we're saying what we're saying is that this is not the only time, but you can you use it to be aware of fixing things, understanding things, knowing things that you would not normally know with a thinking rational mind. And this is why the yogis um, are considered, which when they become uh, the high level of mastery, which is in the state of samadhi, meaning they're in meditation state all the time, they don't even need to sit for meditation anymore. After sitting for 20, 30, 40 years, your mind becomes so peaceful and so in the moment that uh, one who sits for meditation may get glimpses of this peace or this quietness or this inner uh, contemplative uh, mind um, periodically when they sit for meditation. Uh, the, uh, at the advanced stage, the highest stage, one then gets into the realm of being in state of meditation. So you know without being told from outside the answers to anything, if if it's if it's in it's in divine order and it's in your destiny to know, you can know. Now moving into the qigong, the from yoga, because mm-hmm. you you developed this system of yoga combining the two. The monks also developed or had sacred sounds that they somehow figured out could help the organ systems, and the organ systems are connected to the emotions. Tell us a little bit about jump into the traditional Chinese medicine from the yoga uh, and uh, well, tell us how you blended these two systems. Okay, so Qigong, the meaning of it is is that Qi is a life force, the, the, what keeps us alive, you know. It's connected to the breath and the cultivation of it, Gong is the cultivation. So Qi is the life force, Gong is the cultivation of it. So the practices that one would do to cultivate the life force so you have more of it uh, uh, or enough of it to stay well is what Qigong is about. So in in Chinese medicine, there, there are several branches. There's herbal medicine, there's acupuncture, there's tweena massage, and then there's Qigong. I like Qigong because anybody can practice it. And if you don't have acupuncture, uh, needles, or you don't know where the acupuncture points are, if you know the right movements, Qigong movements, you can stimulate the, the liver channels and the energy to flow through it. You can stimulate the kidney channel and the energy to flow kidney, bladder channel, and, and so forth and so on. So you're, you're actually having a medicine that could be for the masses of the people by n- knowing what movements to do for a particular illness or a particular challenge that you have, you can then um, begin to cultivate the, the right movement of the, the life force, the chi, because the chi moves the blood, and blood is the life energy that sustains the organ systems. And so what qigong is meant to do is to help you unblock the channels that come from stress, stress from the environmental toxins, the air, water, food, from not getting enough rest, from negative thoughts or wrong thoughts, wrong thinking, uh, overworking, overachieving, um, just a lifestyle that's out of balance, which is typical of Western living. So Qigong is meant to bring you into a more balanced, harmonious state to open up the and the blockage in the channel to promote health and well-being. But at the highest level, it also includes things like meditation. And, you know, I talk, talked about in our, our yoga, I Ayurveda the concept of kosha, the physical body, the physical kosha, then which is connected to the pranic or the cheap kosha, the breath, and then the mental kosha. And then the emotional body, or vignoya maya kosha, is one of the more subtle aspects and then ultimately you have the spirit body. The, all right. So, but because the emotional body is so close to the spirit body, it's easily affected in affect our health, and it translates into how we think in the mental body. Uh, there's a hierarchy: the spirit body, and then the emotional body, then the mental body, and the chi or primary body, and the physical body. Well, often in the Western medicine, you might find a person having upset stomach or uh, migraine headaches or whatever the issue, indigestion. Uh, 
And so the person may take some medication to deal with the physical symptoms, but it could be coming from the emotional body. For instance, if you're a warrior, all right, emotional worry, it it disturbs the plain stomach channel. And so mm-hmm. the person might have digestive issues. They may have uh, spleen, blood form, um, blood, red blood cell formation issues, um, blood cell carrying oxygen, probably, probably because the heme ion is not mean. Um, form properly in the red blood cell or the B12 issues of utilization of food, the, the, the plasma that's in the blood that's been, being incorporated in the red blood cells to be assimilated around the body. And, and so sometimes have, sometimes, uh, sometimes hydrochloric acid and, and enzymes are shut down when you, we worry, you know. Okay. So that's a fight or flight response, you know. Yeah, and so the person, the person also has lost, loses the sweetness for life. Right. And so that leads to problems with diabetic complications, pre-diabetic complications, because the spleen, stomach, pancreas are all, is also inter- interconnected in that whole digestion, absorption, assimilation process. So um, the, the, these you know, Qigong masters in meditation began to hear the healing sounds that would then purify or cleanse the specific organ system. So the sound that would help, for instance, get one chance and worry, not only to purify the toxic effects of, of having a worry in mind, but it also would um, take you to a state where you, you are purifying that emotion out of your, your mind, spirit, consciousness, so that you're not a warrior anymore. The sound is, ooh. so you're saying, and you could do a particular movement as stretching up with one hand facing up towards the ceiling another palm facing down and you're twisting you're twisting looking up as you're making the sound woo and you're squeezing one side of the body while you're stretching up the opposite side is being squeezed and then you're changing sides and as, as you stretch up you inhale deeply and stretch up and make the, the woo healing sound you're cleansing and purifying that the emotional pattern of, of worrying um, if you sit and just say the sound woo it will take you into the trance meditation state where you can then begin to get an understanding of why you're worrying and how to not worry anymore uh, just by saying the sound mm. because it, I know I know the sound for anger is shoo, shoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. shoe like and, tying your shoe which is kind yeah, of yeah. Uh, an uh, interesting which is word. one of the quickest one of the most um, easy uh, fa- quickest way to get disturbed is through the, the liver channel and uh, the liver gallbladder has to do with rage frustration tension anger and especially in Ayurveda, we reckon, we um, uh, highly recommend that people don't suppress their emotions, meaning you're not going to just blurt out and punch somebody in the face because you get angry, but you're, you're not going to suppress that emotion and, and cause yourself to have hypertension or uh, eye problems or you know migraine headaches or uh, you know, heart attack or stroke because you're suppressing the emotion. But a healthy way to express the emotion would be to do the healing sound for the for the for the liver, uh, the shoe healing sound, and even more potent sounds that um, they discovered that even if you have illness to the say for instance organ system like the liver, if you have um, uh, liver chi stagnation that's not been treated for many years, meaning that the chi is stagnant, the, the life force is stagnated there, and the blood also is stagnant. It leads to things like blood tumors, like like fibroids and so on. Right. And right. it also could lead to things like stenosis of the liver, cholesterol problems, because the liver actually is the source of cholesterol, and, and it, it, it also would mean things like even cancer of the liver. So there's sounds that helps to um, support the liver in regenerating itself and staying uh, regaining his health, the sound um, is um, uh, uh, is the gua healing sound, all right? and it would be it, the the practice is 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 different than just making the healing sound for the liver with the hand hand below around the navel and left hand right hand down for men and left hand on top and making the healing sound shoe with the focus uh, on on the palms, but. In terms of the gua healing sound, the feet would be like um, a good three feet apart, and one would twist to the right and make the healing sound 
uh, with a long sound. And so one would twist from uh, right to left and making that sound and starting with a deep breath, making the sound as you exhale. When, you, when the breath ends, the sound ends, and you should be fully twisted to the left. And you do that nine times because nine is, is uh, the, the representation of the energy um, of the, 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 the energy patterns of the spirit, <clears throat> nine aspects of the spirit. And so then you would do that nine times, and then you'd go from the left to right, but it with a different, we'd go from left to right, inhaling deeply, at the, in fully on the left side, and as you exhale, the same, same healing sound until you, the body is facing forward, and then you change to a higher octave, so you go from and that sound helps to begin to remove stock toxin, toxins that are built up to purify the liver, to regenerate liver cells, liver, liver coffer cells, and mm. to help the liver in its own cleansing and regeneration. Because often, see, the liver is, is connected to the circulation of the blood. is second only to the heart. And because it, the liver takes the blood and it has to be purified by the liver to before it's recirculated throughout the body. Right. And often because there's so much environmental toxins, you know, toxins in the water, pesticide, plastics, um, just pretty poisons put on our skin, you know, uh, <laughs> deodorant. Like you always used to say that. Dyes, pretty you know, uh, <laughs> cosmic, uh, cosmetics and so on. We are, you know, going into the, the liver and then the liver, if we don't do anything to clean the liver, especially during the springtime with green foods and green drinks and green, you know, herbal things that are very known to help the liver, over time, many years, the liver began to get sick. On top of that, people drink a lot of alcohol, and then in combination with that, a lot of frustration and rage and tension and anger and, and even hatred and so forth build up, you know, uh, a ticking time bomb for the liver. So that gua healing sound would help to, as a daily practice, one almost like to It's help. almost like milk thistle, kind of like, because, uh, you know, it's interesting, herbs, I want to get more into in the last uh, mm -hmm. 10 minutes of the show, I want to talk a little about herbs and food. Um, so basically, everything's vibration, as you're basically saying. You know, whether it's the, the mantras from yogic or the sacred sounds developed by the monks, like the shoe that we talked about or the gua, um, a lot of things have to do with vibration. And I guess that's kind of whether it's sound or the vibration of an herb or the vibration of a homeopathic or the vibration of water in our body or the vibration of our thoughts, all that percolates down to the very essence of our body and gives us either health or disease. So what's your, tie, tie this into kind of Ayurveda and your other work with cooking and diet and things like that as we uh, come to the last 10 minutes of the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, one would have to understand that your physical body is a food body, all right? And so what we eat becomes our body. So different people, everyone has a different type, meaning mind-body type. And when we are stressed, and stress comes in many forms, not sleeping, not, not getting enough sunlight, disobeying the laws of, of health, meaning there's a law of health that says you should eat healthy, natural, nutritious, tasty food that then you are eating with some portion of some percentage of it live, so it full, it's full of enzymes that are going to digest. Or if you're not taking... And the food, if the food is cooked, because not everything can be eaten um, raw, you need to take enzymes or have uh, food enzymes that are pre-digested food, like uh, prebiotic type food, like kitchery and so on, to help help the gut uh, and its your body's ability to secrete the right enzymes for itself from the liver enzymes to the stomach acids and the, the protease and, and so on, uh, pepsinogen and so on in the stomach to the salivary gland that secretes um, uh, carbohydrates, amylase and so on, a lipase to help with the digestion. And then the, the small intestine, the pancreas also to help with secretion of enzymes to help you digest and absorb the food into the bloodstream so that you can then make proper assimilation in the spleen with um, the B12 and iron to take up oxygen and B12 to help with the absorption and assimilation of food. So in a nutshell, I'm saying that 
there are laws that we should obey, and most right. of us don't. You know, obey. We 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 the 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 assimilation and digestion of food is one important law that we should obey. Um, we should so get basically front- basically food should feed our cells. Food food we just shouldn't just eat to uh, live to eat. We should eat to live and feed our cells because that feeds the mind and feeds our spirit. This is basically what you're you're basically saying. Yeah, the food, the, the the higher the energy in the food, you call it vibration, it feeds not only the physical body, but it also feeds the subtler body, I mean your, man, your mind and your thought and ability to concentrate and ability to learn and ability to create and have right intuition and insight come from the, the subtilization or the higher energy, you know, the, the, the energized food now begin to feed your, your mind. If you eat, just like if you eat some a big chunk, a big steak or something, very heavy, very dense, and you might find that you want to fall asleep. All right? mm-hmm. But if you nice, eat a nice salad or some fruits or something, you might want to go run a marathon because it has much more energy, it's alive, and it's stimulating the energy in the body. In Ayurveda, we, we consider, well, there are three, it comes to the West as three major main body types. And it's the energy of the, the taste of the food that is identified with the body type. So if you're a vata type, which is the energy of the, the wind and the eater, wind moving through the space in the sky, is for, uh, it, it tends to be drying and stimulating. So that vata energy, a person tends to be, if you look at the person's body, if you're going to try and see, or if it's a vata type person and what is the diet for them, the vata type person is be skinny, slender, wiry, quick movement, quick talking, easily excitable, nervous, anxious type, very creative, very um, um, artistic, um, a spontaneous kind of person. And they, they're the life of the, the office or the home and so forth, energy. But they, they, they um, tend to get ungrounded because they're up in the air all the time. Um, they suffer from issues with coldness, so they need warm foods. They need um, more heavy grounded foods, so root vegetables, uh, heavier grains like brown rice. Um, they also need things like beans that are higher in density, like chickpeas and kidney beans and so on, that are more ground in oils that are um, Soothe the nervous system, calms calms down the particular person, so that ghee and olive oil, the heavier oils, sesame oil that are warming, are better for vata types. The taste that uh, helps to to calm the nervous system and the vata personality would be uh, they they need. Um, the sour taste because it collects moisture. They need the salty taste because it also helps with moisturization and stimulation of the digestion and absorption and so forth. Uh, and it helps uh, the kidneys, the hormonal system. Um, the sour taste helps the liver and the stimulation of the liver. And it all, they, they need the sweet taste because sweet turns into fat. So those would help to... Have, they tend to burn calories quickly, so by eating the sweet taste and that turns into fat, if excess sugar turns into fat, uh, basic biochemistry in the body, they would help to be more stable and grounded and so forth. They need heavier vegetables, like I said, root vegetables, potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, carrots, things that are, grow on the ground or heavier in nature, rather than the light things like lettuce and, you know, things that uh, mm-hmm. in the in Sprout, the air a lot like is not so good for vata. For mm-hmm. pitta types, which would, would, would be the type of medium-built person who tends to be uh, affected by the emotion of anger and frustration easily. They're very super smart people. They tend to like to be in charge. They like, don't like to take orders. Uh, they make good directors and leaders and so forth. They don't like people to waste their time or their intelligence because they're very intelligent. They tend to be the leaders and so on. However, they, um, the, the sour taste and the spicy foods and the you know hot spicy foods and the um, salty taste ag- aggravates pitta. So instead, to calm pitta down, you would need things like sweet taste, bitter to cleanse the blood. Because they have blood issues, tendency to have blood skin issues and so forth. Um, so you would eat you would eat um, 
if, if you wanted the spice taste, you would use things like cumin, coriander, fennel, cardamom, uh, that are cooling, that they have spice taste, but they don't have, it's not hot like cayenne or ginger mm-hmm. and, and yeah. so on, garlic, all right? So yeah. this would be the, the type of things that pitta a type would, would need. Um, in terms of the calf, which is the big-bodied person, the person just walks by the, the kitchen and smells the food and puts on the weight, <laughs> they, <laughs> they need drying, dried foods, drying things like sun-dried tomatoes or uh, apricots or dried mm. apples, things that the moisture is dried out of them. They also need astringent foods, things that are dry out moisture. A good astringent kind of food would be like you bite into, say, um, an, an apple, a green Granny Smith apple. It feels like you're puckering or drying effect in the mouth. Well, that's the same kind of thing on a cell, the same energy. You're talking about energy before. The vibration of that taste on that astringent taste would be. Uh, experience even on the, the cellular level so that right. you dry the moist tendency to, for the cells to have water in them would begin to begin to you know, and, and lose weight lose weight and lose weight yeah by the eating these yeah. yeah then there's also bitter taste the bitter taste mm. is good for the heart good for the cardiovascular system but the bitter also slows down the appetite and and helps the person not to crave so many starchy sweet heavy oily uh creamy you know which you know people uh, copper types it seem like they're attracted to the heavy sweet creamy uh foods because it nourishes them and helps them copper has a tendency to have the emotion of of, of grief and, and, and guilt and even greed and attachment to the law. So these sweet, you know, creamy foods tend to assuage those feelings. And so there's a great atten- tendency for a person to be attracted, if they're kapha type, to be attracted to that, those foods, because it's, it's in a way they're doing uh, therapy, self-healing by eating foods that help them to transcend or get beyond the emotions of, the, of of being feeling grieved over loss or attachment, you know, like a person goes on an eating binge because they they lose an opportunity or lose something of value. The person uses mm-hmm. food, uh, ice cream or some, you know, every heavy, sweet, cold thing to help them transcend or deal with the, the, the issue. But then they put on 30, 40, 50 pounds by doing that. The, uh, the uh, opposite is true. For for copper types, you need movement. You, you know, we don't have, so we don't have stagnant pools of water. We need alkalinity. We need stimulation with um, rigorous movement. We need spicy, hot ginger, pippoli, black pepper, chikatoo, things like that to stimulate the movement of the water out of the cells. We need foods that are high in uh, potassium that kicks waste and water out of the cells. So, you know, eggplant would be one. Green bananas, uh, these are very, very astringent. Green bananas, plantain, green plantain, not the ripe ones so much, but these are very, very astringent, meaning they dry moisture out, so they'd be very good for, for, for kaffa. Light grains like quinoa and millet and so on, uh, because light is counteracting the heaviness of copper, and it would then help the person to be uh, more balanced and not be so attached to things that are in the past or uh, craving for things that they don't have as yet and create, a, you know, uh, aggravation in their, their mind spirit. Um, you know, I was telling you that. One of the things that we we're, we're working on in terms of helping people is to understand that in the body we talk about mama points for a moment here. It's like acupuncture, there are many many um, specific points on the body. In the soles of the feet are major points, the kidney points, the liver points, uh, the gallbladder, the stomach channels are in the feet in, in and so forth, the spleen, all right, in the big toe and across and so on, the instep, the, the, the kidney points and so on, around the ankles and so on. Well, I'm saying that to say, you know, we have all these energy channels that are in the calf muscles and the, around the knees, the major joints, uh, very sacred points, psychic points around the ankles, around the knees, the navel is a major point because it connects you to the mother and the prenatal chi that's passed on to you from what you inherited from your ancestors and so forth in the womb. Well, the same, you can 
anoint with um, special oils, kapha oil. If you have a cough, too much uh, ama or toxins in the in the stomach, and you have poor digestion, poor elimination, and so forth, uh, to anoint the navel with kapha oil. If you're ungrounded and nervous, anxious, can't sleep, um, scattered thinking, you might use vata oil. If you're you know, hot-headed, uh, aggressive, bossy type. Um, you might use pitta oil to um, anoint the the navel, and these are major mama points. Huh? The another mama point that I want to mention is the the, the xiphoid bone, the little tail hanging off of the sternum. If you press in in the air where there's a little indention. You can hold that with some of the particular oil for your body type. If you're pitta type, you use pitta oil and so forth. And hold it for two minutes and focus on your awareness there. And you will help with digestion in the upper stomach, remove acidity, burning, and so forth. And just holding that point, gastric upset and so on. Unfortunately, if you were, we're running out of time. It's, uh, it's already uh, 50-something after the hour, so we're going to have to... Uh, yeah, but the point show. that yeah, thank you. But I was saying yeah. these are special points that can one can use by knowing where and how what to press and holding for two minutes, uh, focusing the mind and you even saying sacred words or mantras that are specific to that point. One can facilitate their own healing. I guess in a nutshell, if I have to say one wrap up thought is that most of the work I'm doing is to bring the knowledge to the people about what is the the natural healing science that they can use in their own lives at home, whether it be diet, whether it be qigong or yoga or yogong or mama therapy, you don't really need to have a doctor or you need to have special medicine. Much of these things are things that we're doing every day. If you know the right exercises, the right breathing, the right points to press, or the right diet, one can stay well all the time. Where can folks get in contact with you, Master Harris? Well, you know, um, you can contact me at uh, my phone. It's 203-864-5399. Uh, uh, 203-864-5399. That's probably the best way. Or you can email me at uh, eharris05 at snet.net. That's eharris05 at snet.net. Looking forward to your books coming out, uh, coming up soon. Um, we're learning about yogang and diet and more about Ayurveda from your perspective. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll have to have you on to continue our discussions of these ancient sciences because we just scratched the surface and there's so much more to discuss. But thank you so much for taking the time to really delve into and weave these things together into an integral system. Appreciate it. Many All blessings. Right, all right, man. Thank you for allowing me to be on with you, and and um, hopefully maybe we can get together. I can share some of these with you personally. Yes, yeah, sounds great. Okay, and that does it for another edition of the Natural Nurse and Doctor Z. Wishing you folks health and wellness. Bye bye. Till next week. 